when I took this photo in 1962, I never would have dreamed I'd be taking this photo 25 years later from the same spot. Hello everyone, welcome to Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. Today we're gonna to take a chronological tour of my favorite airport, New York International. But before the airport looked like this, it looked like this. Idlewild, as it was called back then, opened in July of 1948. It was built on 5,000 acres of landfill and swamp located on Jamaica Bay, about 18 miles southeast of Manhattan. This is what the ramp looked like in the early days. And across uh, runway 13, uh, you could see uh, the uh, iconic triple arch roof hangars, uh, which were there uh, until very recently. In the early 50s, you could take a New York Airways S-55 helicopter out from Manhattan, uh, which cut the travel time uh, quite a bit compared to a car. And here we see the temporary tower that was built uh, in the early 50s uh, before the uh, construction of the International Arrivals Building, which you see uh, just starting here. It was referred to as the IAB. And on that ramp in 1958, the jet age began Saturday, October 4th, 1958, the British Comet uh, inaugurated jet uh, passenger service across the Atlantic for the very first time, beating the Boeing 707. We were there that day on the observation deck. But one trip, not to be outdone, ordered a 707 parked at the adjacent ramp, and that kind of stole some of the thunder from the uh, British Comet. And here you see a beautiful depiction of uh, from props to jets. On October 25th, 1958, Pan Am launched their jet service from New York to Paris, literally retracing Lindbergh's route some 30 years earlier when he flew solo uh, in the spirit of St. Louis. Uh, the jet uh, made the trip in six hours, quite a bit faster. And no, I didn't sneak out on the runway to take this picture. In 1959, the flight seer bus, uh, which is actually a tram, gave uh, sightseeing rides around the airport on the perimeter road. And for $1.50, you'd get about a 20 minute ride and you'd get uh, scenes like this. Now, I apologize, I was shooting with a kind of a crummy old uh, Kodak camera. That's what I had back in those days, uh, but uh, uh, the content I think is, is worth it. So I'll share these photos with you. Here was a jet that came in from Australia via the West Coast. I thought that was pretty cool. And this is from the observation deck of the IAB. And so is this. Now this photo was taken by my dear friend, uh, the late Terry Waddington, whom I met at Douglas. He was one of Douglas's top uh, salesmen and uh, airliner enthusiast, and he always had a camera. I can't help but wonder if Terry and I were standing on the same observation deck shooting airplanes and never knew it. But uh, you can see the resemblance here in terms of location. And uh, over at United in 1961, the uh, French Caravelle began service. This was just a, what an elegant looking airplane. Uh, it uh, was parked out on the, an apron away from the, the uh, jetways. Uh, because passengers boarded uh, by the rear stairs. And this operated a uh, unique men-only executive service between New York and Chicago. Uh, at nine in the morning and five at night, caravels left each city in each direction, uh, allowing businessmen to literally commute between the two cities in one day. It was kind of cool. And then across the Van Wyck Expressway, we had the Eastern Terminal, and uh, they had an outdoor observation deck, as you can see here. Uh, it was Great fun in the summertime, not so much in the wintertime, got pretty cold, but uh, uh, these were the vistas and the views that you could enjoy uh, in those days. And this is the very first airliner I ever flew in, uh, an Eastern DC-7B. We sat in first class. It was a trip uh, uh, over to Philadelphia, but that was my first experience in an airliner. And uh, 804 Delta was the aircraft. Here's the same airplane uh, taken by, um, uh, my dear friend John Proctor. And again, I can't help but think that John and I were standing on that same deck uh, many times uh, taking pictures and, and never, never realized it. John took this beautiful photo of the first TWA 707s. And you notice that they're parked out on the ramp well away from the uh, prop liners. Uh, and this was before TWA or Pan Am had their own individual terminals. 
And in those days, the TWA jets and Pan Am jets would uh, arrive at the IAB because they would clear customs using those facilities. And here, of course, you have the beautiful whispering giant, BOEC uh, Britannia. And that S-55 helicopter was replaced by the Vertol 44 in the late 1950s. This uh, carried 14 passengers and uh, kind of motored out to the uh, airports from Manhattan. And the Vertol 44 was replaced by a twin turbine Boeing Vertol 107, which carried 25 passengers and uh, really uh, established uh, uh, good uh, convenient helicopter service all through the New York area. Also that year, 1962, the TWA uh, iconic bird terminal opened. And sadly, a year later, November of 63, this nation uh, lost our beloved president. But on Christmas Eve day, 1963, New York International Airport was renamed John F. Kennedy International Airport. And I would have been in this photo if I just stayed put. I was standing by that column at the left in the back and I decided to go around to get a better look at Ted Kennedy, who was at the podium. And that's me just leaving uh, out of frame in the, in the picture. But I was there that day. I thought it was pretty important and I wanted to, uh, wanted to attend. In February 64, these guys arrived at uh, Kennedy Airport, although this photo was taken on their 1965 tour when they played at uh, Shea Stadium. They were in town for an appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show. And uh, I think they did pretty good after that. But in 64 and 1965, we had the World's Fair uh, located up near LaGuardia Airport and TWA had a dedicated uh, Sikorsky S61, uh, which flew from uh, Kennedy Airport to the rooftop uh, helipad at the New York World's Fair. That was pretty neat. But speaking of neat uh, venues, this is one of my favorites. Uh, of course, you have the Golden Door restaurant just below the sign there. And then on the tower, up on the 12th floor was an uh, enclosed observation deck. You'd take the elevator up there, put 10 cents in the turnstile, and you'd have literally the same view that the uh, controllers had in the cab one floor above you. Uh, they had earphones, you could hear ATC, and you got a, just a stunning view of the airport. And then looking down at the ramp, this is uh, the IAB as it was undergoing uh, construction for the coming uh, jumbo jets in the late 60s. And you see the uh, Russian IL-62 uh, parked with the uh, two Vickers Boeing, I'm sorry, Super VC-10s. The first uh, Aeroflot IL-62 service was in July of 68 from Moscow to New York. Pan Am had a reciprocal service from New York to Moscow. This is the day that the first flight arrived, July 15th, 1968. I was there and it was uh, an interesting event. You notice the Pan Am boarding uh, stairs for the airplane. And also you notice the uh, trademark tail wheel that the IL-62s had to make sure that uh, they stayed level uh, on the ground. Uh, we're gonna go out to 150 street, 150th Street and uh, do some spotting. Uh, this is a different airplane, but uh, same uh, markings on the IL-62. And uh, what you could do in those days, you can't do it anymore, but what you could do back then was to pull up uh, off the road onto the grass and uh, you get shots like this all day long, just a great, you know, sun was behind you, it was perfect. Um, invariably, you'd see cars with the trunks open uh, and spare tires leaning against the fender and the uh, airport police would come by, hey, you need any help? And no, everything's okay, fine. we're just gonna change the tire, we'll be out of here in a minute. Okay, have a nice day. And then you'd turn around and go, oh, look, an 880, oh, cool, wow. And stay there all afternoon shooting airplanes. Uh, came back a year later with uh, color film, and uh, this is one of the very first uh, 747s to operate in 1970. And then at that location, you're right on the corner of the taxiway where the uh, freighters would come out of the uh, freight terminals, and you'd catch them uh, heading out to uh, uh, other runways. And this is a Seaboard World uh, DC-863 freighter. Well, by now, what was called Terminal City was uh, pretty much complete. The last uh, step was to uh, replace the very original terminal from 1948. And you see that happening here on the right side of the picture with the new British Airways and new national terminals that were under construction. And there you can see the Quonset huts, which was all that was left of the original airport. 
that same year, TWA expanded their terminal uh, and added uh, the uh, jet wings for the jumbo jets, which you see on the left. And here's a takeoff shot two years later, 1972, taking off on uh, one three right. And looking back at the airport, you see terminal two, we used to call it the shoe box on the left side there and originally uh, was home to Northwest on the north side, Northeast on the south side where you see the yellow birds and Braniff on the west side. And then as we climb out, uh, this is the Pan Am World Port. Uh, it was the original terminal, the umbrella terminal in 1960. And then they added the uh, jumbo jet gates uh, in 1970. And if you've ever been to an airliner convention, this is a classic name the plane shot. Uh, raise your hand if you can guess which kind of airplane this is. Oh, you got it, good. It's a DC-861, United Airlines. The British Airways Terminal, uh, this is 1984, coming in by helicopter. You see the Concorde there in the center and British Airways and other operators, uh, charter uh, companies uh, at the other gates. In 1991, Delta acquired Pan Am, and so that umbrella terminal uh, looked like this, and they also had the new 26-story tower uh, built in that decade. And you remember the concrete uh, bird terminal for TWA? In 2001, American Airlines acquired TWA, and I was assigned to uh, take a last loving look at the TWA terminal before it was closed. Uh, and before it became a hotel, which it is now. But I did an article for uh, Airliners Magazine and got a look at the uh, terminal as they were literally closing it down. It was no longer operating. Uh, all of the uh, flights were over at American. But uh, it was still just a pristine condition and just an amazing piece of architecture. Uh, you see the TWA Ambassadors Club at the top of the stairs there and the Lisbon Lounge and Paris Cafe got out on the ramp and took a look at the uh, beautiful architecture designed by Aero Saarinen, the Finnish uh, architect. And uh, the, air the airport came quite far from those early days. Uh, here we have the, uh, the triple arch roof hangars as it looked uh, when the airport opened. And this is as they looked just before they were uh, taken down about five years ago. I was back in New York on a trip to review the JetBlue Mint service for my friends over at uh, airlineratings.com. And that was my last visit to the airport. And I thought I'd uh, close, even though those observation decks were gone, you can still get some pretty good shots. This is the JetBlue tribute aircraft to the fire department of New York as a 9-11 uh, memorial. And I thought I'd close uh, by driving out to Rockaway Boulevard, which was always a favorite spot. Uh, you could pull up on the side of the road and take shots like this. Uh, of airplanes landing on runway 22 left. Uh, look closely, this is a straight pipe TWA 707 in 19, still operating in 1969. And uh, same spot, different day, looks like a crosswind landing for this uh, Super VC-10. But there you have it, a visit to my favorite airport and a great uh, site for spotters even to this day, JFK. Hope you enjoyed this episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machette. As always, special thanks to a couple of folks that made those visits to the airport so wonderful for me, uh, Lee Stevens and John Sloan of New York Airways. Uh, just uh, some great memories of a wonderful, wonderful place. So until next time, take care.